Good morning, my apologies. Welcome to Ebenezer Baptist Church. I was running just a little bit behind. I got caught in traffic. For those of you that don't know, I just live two houses away. Amen. There might have been a deer or squirrel out there. You never can tell. Whoo, that's a nice little run through the parking lot this morning. May God bless you. I'm glad to see you this morning here at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Glad to see the parents of the bride here this morning, and God bless you all this day. But as we begin our worship, could I invite you to please stand as we sing together, Low in the Grave. It'll be in the end service. God bless you. Welcome again to Ebenezer Baptist Church. I know that some of you have been visiting, especially while you're waiting on me. But if you would, take this opportunity to make eye contact and give a little wave and tell hello to one another. And that it's good to see them in the house of the Lord. Amen. It sure is. Hold on. Better be blessed any place else you can be. <laughs> As we continue on with our singing, crown him with many crowns. Also in the answer.
Well, good morning, Ebenezer. I don't know about y'all, but that second he arose in the chorus there, I kind of needed to bump down into that lower octave on that one. Uh, 8.30 in the morning, it's hard for that one. But all praise to Jesus, amen? Amen, amen. We got a few announcements. We have a kind of a lot going on as we're kind of reopening uh, last week and this week. And so let me just hit a, a, some of these things that are opening up, starting, and how they're starting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, first, Children's Church is starting back up today during the 1030 service, and they're going to meet upstairs in the first and second grade classroom. I know that's not all of you or many of you, but just take note of that. If you know somebody who's been waiting on Children's Church for service, that's starting back up again. Wednesday night children's programs are back in session. Uh, just note that for the RAs and GAs, we are uh, requiring masks for that specific group uh, of children that's meeting. So just make note of that. Sunday school is starting back next week at 930. Uh, and as far as I know, that's just in your normal classrooms, normal time, normal it feels weird saying normal nowadays. I'm just saying we're not normal. But Sunday school will just be as it used to be. Same bat time, same bat channel, all that good stuff. Discipleship training. So all of our discipleship training classes, uh, we're going to hold off on those, postpone those until after the beginning of the year. So just make note of that. Uh, and then finally, one, one good announcement. Uh, not that the other ones weren't good as well. We're reopening, and that's fantastic. Uh, this Friday night, we're going to have a family movie night. So this is really geared towards our elementary and younger children. Uh, we're going to have a movie in here. Just bring uh, chairs or a blanket, whatever. We're going to move some of these chairs out of the way here. Uh, so everybody has room to spread out on the floor. We're going to project it on the wall, watch a movie, bring some snacks and drinks. And we're just going to have a good time uh, together watching a movie and enjoying each other's company as much as possible. That's all the announcements that I have for today, and so now I'm going to hand it over to Brother Art for our morning prayer. It's time for altar call, or not altar call, but uh, deacon prayer, and uh, I'd like for us to remember the Merrick family and the passing of Ray Jr., and uh, there's many, many other prayers, uh, shut-ins and the people that just can't get out or are afraid to get out in this time of uh, this pandemic. Glad to see Mike back. And, uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Most kind and gracious, loving Father, we bow before you at this time and just ask that you forgive us our sins and wrongdoings, Father. We just look to you, Father, for guidance, and you're an awesome God creator of everything and father I just pray that you would uh, be with their nation in this time of need uh, with this virus that's going on father I just pray that you would be with each one that uh, gets it that you would uh, heal them speedily I pray that this uh, nation would uh, fall to their knees because of all the evil that's going on Lord, I don't understand, but uh, all of these riots and uh, damaging property and hurting other people and downing the police department and the military, it's just crazy, Lord. I just pray that you would intervene, that you would help us to support those folks that try to do right and try to take care of things and I pray, Lord, that you'd be this upcoming election that uh, we put aside the parties, Father, and just look at the person, the character. And Father, I pray that we would uh, choose the one that you would have us to choose, Father, that will we'll look to you for their wisdom and guidance, Father. And Father, I pray that you'd be with their uh, the church now as we keep starting up different programs i pray that everything will go smoothly father and that we can get back into your fellowship with each other and, and lord we thank you for this uh 
opportunity to meet today that we have a place that we can meet and you make it possible for us to uh, come and fellowship with each other and fellowship with you father pray now that you'd be with brother Kerry as he uh, stands before us in a few minutes and brings your word just speak through him the words you have us to hear and once again just be with each one that's represented here in these things we ask in thy wonderful and holy name amen stand for the reading of God's word this day and then we'll sing a couple more songs we'll be reading from the book of 1st Peter or the epistle of 1st Peter from chapter 1 starting in verse 3 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer various griefs and trials so that the proven character of your faith more valuable than gold which though perishable is refined by fire may result in praise glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ though you have not seen him you love him though not seeing him now you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls may God bless the reading of his word this day for us and as we continue in our worship will you please turn to your insert with me with to fairest Lord Jesus said amen turn on to the back page right there his name is wonderful
Okay, there we go. Do well, everybody doing all right today? I know these early services can sometimes be a little hard to get up for. I think we've gotten used to it by now, though, right? We kind of, I know at our house we've kind of gotten into a Sunday morning, new Sunday morning routine now, uh, with being up. Uh, Bob is on vacation this week, as I understand it. He is going to St. Louis uh, to visit a friend. Uh, so just be in prayer for him uh, as he visits, that he'd have safe travel, uh, that he'd be safe while he's there. I mean, travel kind of, you know, nowadays is a little bit dangerous with just getting out and about out of your own little habitat there and everything. So uh, just be in prayer for him uh, for safety and, and relaxation as he's gone this week. Uh, so with that said, and why I'm up here, I'll be preaching this week. We're going to be in First Peter chapter 1. Uh, our main text is going to be starting in verse 13 this week. And while you're turning, we have your pages flipping, uh, let me pray for us uh, before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here today. Uh, that without uh, your mercy and your grace, uh, we wouldn't even be here. And so uh, we thank you uh, just for, for being here today. We pray now that you would... Uh, bless uh, the proclamation of your word, uh, Father, that uh, this wouldn't be uh, me or my words, uh, that, but that uh, I would be uh, your vessel, that you would speak through me, uh, that you would speak through your word uh, to us today, uh, so that we would uh, leave here changed people, that we'd leave here people uh, more dedicated to you with our lives, more in focus on you. Uh, help us uh, to do that today. Bless us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So as I said, we'll be starting in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. And it says, therefore, and of course, like I always say, when we see a therefore, we like to stop and look what it's there for. Of course, we know this is a, a connecting word that's connecting what was previously said to what's about to be said because they follow in some kind of logical pattern. And so what was right before that speaks of salvation. Starting in verse 3, Peter says this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So, what we're about to get into is a direct result or a direct consequence of salvation. Peter is saying that because of the fact of salvation in your life, then what he's about to talk about should also be true in your life. He's saying, if you're saved, then this should be evident also. And he gives three things in the verse that we're about to look at, verse 13, uh, that are the response of those who have received salvation. Now, you're thinking, oh, three things, three points, right? No. These three things are actually, we're going to look at them because they're the setup for the points we're going to talk about today, but they are important. It's a bit like a lead-up to a football game or uh, any other kind of sports game. 
Uh, there's things that you need to do to get ready to play. You need to drink plenty of water. You probably need to have a good meal beforehand. It's a good idea to stretch. You need to make sure you're wearing the right equipment. And these points are like that for our Christian life. The things we have to do to get ready for the big game. So, verse 13 says this, Therefore, because of the fact of salvation in your life, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Three things in this verse that are mentioned that are a direct result and response to salvation. First, because of salvation... Gird up the loins of your mind. Now, girding up your loins is not something we're real familiar with, mostly because we don't tend to wear robes all the time anymore. But back in Jesus' time, back in the apostles' time, when everybody wore the robes, when they needed to get ready to do something, whether that was sports or work or something like that, for you ladies that wear dresses, you know if you're wearing a long dress, it is difficult to take a long stride, right? Right? There's a lot of stuff in the way. It's, it's, you just kind of end up doing this number, right, if you need to stretch and do. So what they would do is they would hike up the robe, reach back behind and grab the back, pull it around, and tuck it into their belt. So it made shorts of a sort. What it did was pull all that fabric up so then they were free. You know, they could, you know, move their legs around, get ready to work, get ready to do whatever. And that's what Paul is, the picture Paul is using here, but he's saying the loins of your mind. To put it in modern terms, we would say, get your mind ready or prepare your mind. Get your mind ready to go. Don't let your mind be lazy. Second, because of salvation, Peter says, be sober or sober-minded. And some translations say self-controlled here. Uh, This is a direction to keep your wits or your awareness about you, to be alert. We could probably include don't get distracted in here as well. It's a call to focus. Like a watchman on the walls, don't go to sleep, keep the watch, stay alert. Third, Peter says to set your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the word fully in this verse is a Greek word that means completely or unchangeably. So he's saying, set your hope completely in the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't put your hope in anything but Jesus Christ. Other things will let you down and will not prepare you for the main thing, the big game. Again, I mention these because they are the preparation for what comes next. But there's one thing I do want to point out about all three of these things. All three of these things that Peter mentions are active things. They require you to do something. Gird up your loins. Be sober-minded. It's active because you have to get to the point of being alert, and you have to keep yourself at the point of being alert. And then set your hope. These aren't passive things. These are not things that just happen to you because of salvation. You don't get saved and all of a sudden, oh, loins are girded, mind's alert and ready, hope fully set. Doesn't happen. It requires effort and action on your part to do these things. Gird your own loins, keep your mind sober, set your hope. The Christian life is not a spectator sport. You are required to be an active participant. With that said, because that's the setup for what's come to next, we move to verse 14. Verse 14 says, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance— Peter says, as obedient children, which reminds the reader that what is about to come next, the commands that are about to come, are a result of salvation. 
For it is only through salvation that we are adopted into God's family and made co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We are made children, but it doesn't stop there. We are to be obedient children. Again, requires action and effort on your part, being obedient. It says, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. Now, the, the King James and the New King James uh, and even the NIV have this as not conforming yourselves. Many other translations uh, translate this as do not be conformed. And some others say do not allow yourself to be conformed. And I, I prefer that reading of, of this verse here, this do not be conformed or do not allow yourself to be conformed. Um, one, I think it fits better with the, the tense of the Greek verb, but I think it fits better with the overall point Peter's trying to make here. So what Peter is saying is to not allow yourself to be conformed to your former lusts or passions as you were before you were saved. It says you are now obedient children, and as such, you shouldn't allow the life you used to live in sin come back and force itself on you and tell you how to live now. And that's point number one for today. We are to resist being conformed to a lifestyle of sin. I have some Play-Doh here today. And we're going to try not to make a mess out of it and get this out quickly. So I have some Play-Doh here. Let's just imagine this is us. Right? Play-Doh. Ready to go. Let's say this mold, it's a person. You probably can't see it, but just trust me, it's a person. This mold is a person. This is your former life. In Romans 12, Paul calls it the world. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. Peter says, do not be conformed to your former lust, your former passions. And see, what's happening is, this is us as Christians free, ready to be who God wants us to be. We have our former lust coming at us going, no, no, you need to be this. You need to be here. You need to fit this mold. This is who you need to be. The mold wants to be on you. It wants to shape you to be like it. And that is what happens when you approach the Christian life in a passive way. You think, oh, I'm saved. I'm, I'm going to heaven. I'm good. That's what salvation's about, right? Getting to heaven. Your loins aren't girded. Your mind's not sober and alert. Your hope is not fully set. And when you live the Christian life passively like that, squish, squeeze, here you are. You're being conformed to your former passions. You're being conformed to the world if you're not ready and aware if you're not prepared this is happening to you and the scary thing about this is passive Christians are a little bit like that proverbial frog in the cooking pot where if you boil the water first and try to put the frog in what will happen it's going to jump out right we well, put the water in put the frog in and then turn the water on what happens? Frog stays in, right? Stays in. Doesn't notice the water getting hot. Just so thinks, hmm, well, this is nice. And before you know it, the frog is in boiling water and is no longer alive because he stayed in the water. If you live the Christian life passively, that is what happens. It doesn't happen all at once. It happens slowly. So slowly you don't even know what's happening because you're not prepared you're not ready. You didn't get your mind ready. You're not sober and alert. You didn't set your hope fully in Jesus Christ. And before you know it, you're here. And the scariest part about it is you may not even realize this is you. Because you're not even looking. Conforming influences sneak up on you slowly. But if your loins are girded, if your mind is sober, 
if your hope is fully set, you see it coming. You know to resist. See it coming, hey, you need to be like us. Like, no, I realize, I recognize what this is. This is my former life. I have a new life in Christ Jesus. Nope, staying out of that. But that only happens if your loins are girded, your mind is sober, and your hope is fully set. If you are actively participating in the Christian life, that happens. We cannot afford to be passive with our faith. We have to be actively looking for ways that we are being pressured to conform, and we have to be prepared to take the, the stand that resistance calls for. What our attitude should be reminds me of a, of a quote from Mark Twain. <clears throat> One time Mark Twain said this. He said, let men label you as they may. If you alone of all the nation decide one way, and that way be the right way by your convictions of the right, hold up your head, for you have nothing to be ashamed of. It doesn't matter what the press says. It doesn't matter what the politicians or the mob say. It doesn't matter if the whole country decides that something wrong is something right. When the mob and the press and the whole world tell you to move, your job is to plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth and tell the whole world, no, you move. Point number one, we are to resist being conformed to a lifestyle of sin. Now we'll move on to verses 15 and 16. They say this, but in contrast to what we just read, about being conformed. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Peter says, rather than being conformed to your old sinful lifestyle, become like the one who called you to salvation. And what is he like? He is holy. Holiness is God's highest characteristic. When he describes himself in the simplest terms that encompass all of his character, he says, I am holy. Everything else, God's love, his justice, his mercy, his wrath, his anger, his judgment, all fall under his holiness. In all those things, how God acts is always holy holy. And that's what verse 16 reiterates. It's a quotation from Leviticus 11, where God says twice in verses 44 and 45 of Leviticus 11 that the Israelites are to be holy, for I am holy. God is holy, and we are to be like him. Peter says we are to be holy in all of our conduct. Just like God is holy in everything he does, we are to also be holy in everything we do. And that's point number two. Simply, we are to be holy like God is holy. And that raises a very good question. How do we know what holiness looks like? Well, two ways. First, God told us. The Old Testament is full of laws that God gave to the Israelites. And all of those were given so that they would know how to be holy like God is holy. He just told them in Leviticus 11, be holy like I am holy. Okay, God, how do we do that? Another place God says, well, love me properly and love other people properly. Okay, God, how do we do that? Here's Ten Commandments. First four are about loving me properly. The last six are about loving other people properly. Okay, well, what exactly do those look like? Here's books of laws on how you ought to conduct yourselves that all fall under the category of be holy like I am holy. And then God gave us the New Testament to further tell us what holiness looks like 
for those of us who belong to his church. In the second way, God didn't just tell us, he showed us. God himself came as a man and lived all of those laws perfectly. Said, this is what holiness looks like. I told you, and now I've shown you. So how do we know what holiness looks, looks like? Read the Bible. It's right here. He told us, he showed us, and he wrote it all down and preserved it through millennia so that we could have it, so we could know what holiness looks like. And this is where that being passive versus being active comes back into play. We can't just get saved and then say, Walking on sunshine to eternity, here I go. We don't just get our get out of hell free card, and that's that. We have a responsibility, a duty, a requirement to be holy, and that takes activeness on our part. We have to know God's laws, and then we have to do God's laws. But here's the problem. Here's my worry with this. My worry is that even when we know God's laws, we have a tendency to treat God's laws kind of like how we treat the speed limit. You know what I mean. Everybody sees the speed limit signs. You know what the speed limit is on the interstate, on your road, right? We see the speed limit as more of a suggestion than a rule. 35, eh, probably not 35, right? right? Hardly anyone actually goes the speed limit on just about any road you're, you can name, with the possible exception of if you're Morgan Freeman and you're driving Miss Daisy. And we have various justifications for breaking the speed limit, Right? Well, I know it says 70 on the interstate, but they're probably not going to pull you over unless you're doing 10 or, 10 or more over, right? So what's, what's the speed limit really? Well, it's 79, right? Oh, you can go however fast you want to until you see a cop, then slow down. The speed limit's whatever you want it to be until you're in the presence of authority, and then the speed limit's the speed limit. You guys know all the ones. I don't need to go over anymore. Everybody knows what the speed limit is. There's plenty of signs, but people choose to ignore it and justify why they do it as not wrong. Sadly, I really do believe that we have a tendency to take that same stance towards God's laws. We know what they are, but we find reasons to skirt around actually doing them. Well, you know, that verse really doesn't mean that. Well, I mean, I just do it, I do it a little bit. That guy does it a lot. Nobody, nobody knows I'm doing it, so, you know, I'm not hurting anybody, it's okay. Well, other, other Christians are doing it. But that is not how we are to approach being holy. God is the standard for holiness. He has shown us and told us what it looks like. And anything short of that standard is not holiness. It's true or false, A or B. There's not a scale. You either are or you're not. I think it's bad enough that we know the laws and try to justify not keeping them. What I think maybe is probably worse is that we know the laws. We just never actually take the time to apply them to all our conduct. We never stop to ask the question, 
is it holiness how I'm spending my money? Is it holiness how I'm dealing with my family? Is it holiness how I'm approaching work? Is it holiness how I'm raising my kids? Too many Christians look at the culture around them and just accept that what is happening is fine. And frankly, that is simply not good enough when our call is to be holy like God is holy. We should question every part of our lives to see if we are living in holiness or not. And that means that we have to be brave enough to pursue holiness in every aspect of our lives. That means, as I said before, planting yourself by the river of truth and refusing to move. Point number two, we are to be holy like God is holy. So now we come to verses 17 through 19. It says this, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter says, if you call on the Father, which is his way of saying here, if you're saved, conduct yourselves for the whole rest of your life in fear. And fear here means a reverence towards God. As one commentary I read put it, fear producing vigilant caution lest we offend God and backslide. A reverence that produces vigilant caution lest we offend God. Reverence for what? Peter tells us. Back to verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Reverence for what? The price that was paid for your ransom. That's point three. Show reverence in every area of your life for the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of the price that was paid for your salvation. Because of what what was required was not perishable stuff like gold or silver. It was the priceless untainted blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of God himself. We should be living our lives in reverence of the blood that made it possible for you to be holy. We should be cautious in all our conduct to make sure that we are being holy. Why is it so important that we not be conformed, that we be holy, that we gird our loins, that we be sober-minded, that we set our hope fully in Jesus Christ? Because the price that was paid for you to be able to even start doing that is way too high for you to act flippantly about your Christian life. We cannot be passive and nonchalant about our faith and our holiness. The blood of Jesus Christ is not down at the bargain bin at Walmart. It is not cheap. It is not something that is just out there that everybody can get it. But it it is precious and valuable, and it is what bought your life in Jesus Christ, and we deserve He deserves the reverence for his sacrifice and his life with our full and uncompromising devotion. The question we have to ask is, are we? Are we reverent of the blood of Jesus Christ? Are we ready and aware 
Are we watching and resisting conforming to our old lives of sin? Are we actively seeking to be holy in all of our conduct? Because here's my fear, church. My fear is that we will sit here and nod and agree. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When we hear that the price that bought our salvation and our ability to be holy is precious and valuable. But then we're going to walk out these doors and we're not once actually going to consider our conduct and whether or not it's holy. We will drive down the road, go to a restaurant, go home, watch TV, check social media, go to work, go to school, do sports, and not once ask ourselves, is this holy? Am I being holy in how I'm doing this? Am I being conformed to my old life? The price that bought you is too high for you not to ask yourself those questions. And when we as Christians, the ones who were bought with that high price, can't be bothered to conduct our lives in a holy manner, we show the true value that we put on the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is not much. We are to place the proper value on the blood of Jesus Christ that bought us. And that means reverence towards it and a dedication to holiness in our lives. We have three points for today. Point one, we are to resist being conformed to a lifestyle of sin. Point two, we are to be holy like God is holy. And point three, we are to show reverence in every area of our lives for the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to have Kenny and Patty come. Can we sing uh, Nothing But the Blood? What can wash away my sin? Have you seen that song? As they come, we get ready to sing. Uh, Can I get everybody to to bow your heads and close your eyes real quick? I'm not going to try to lead you. I don't know what God is dealing with you today. Hopefully something I said here is maybe something going on with you. God is dealing with you. It could be something totally else. And just being here at church and hearing his word is convicting you getting you in that place. If, if I'm going to pray for you. If you'd like me to pray for you, say, hey, God is working on me right now. God is, is talking to me in my heart and in my head. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you during this time. Okay. That's it. You can, raise, you, can, you can raise your heads. Open your eyes. Raise your heads. Kenny, let's sing. Have a wonderful Sunday.